Hey everybody, it's your girl Bunny. It's Hulu's original series, Wu-Tang, an American Saga. Season one, episode 10, entitled Assassination Day. What a wonderful way to end the season and wrap it up for season two. I'll recap the entire episode and review as I go along. That's all coming up next. We can say Wu-Tang now. Wu-Tang, Wu-Tang. It's Bunny. We see that the same intern in the last episode that was boxing up all of the tapes that were from artists that were either released from Tommy Boy Records or they never came out with an album. So they had singles that he was placing into the box to box it up and move it away. But he goes into his apartment. He sees that there's a party going on and we see a young lady that has a shot glass and says, hey, Tribe Called Quest, they made another sports reference so we can guess that there's some type of royalty that goes along with that or that e e that evolution of hip-hop correlating with sports um so they're celebrating because of that and he says you know this is great and i love that we're celebrating the night goes on and people have fallen asleep, but these two are still up, a young lady and the, the intern for Tommy Boy Records. And she says, it's this continuous cycle of ha having genuine good artists that are overshadowed by artists that are corporate friendly acts. Uh, and it just keeps going and keep keeps going, which still happens to this day. And he says, well, you know, I don't like that in the record industry, but that's what sells and that's what makes money. And she says, explain to me what you mean. And he says, well, MC Hammer keeps all of the artists afloat that are on this particular label. And she says, well, that makes sense and I get what you're saying. And he says, when I get my own record label, I'm gonna do the same thing. Yes, you will have artists that put out good music, but we know that the audience, it all depends on the audience and what they want. And we see that until this day. They may not be uh, the seasoned, crisp, true artists that they are, but whatever's trending and whatever people are adhering to, they're gonna buy it. And he says, name one record label that has integrity. And she says two words, Def Jam. And he says two words, Beastie Boys. So he was making a point in saying, even though you had Run DMC on there and you had all of these acts on Def Jam, for some reason we had the Beastie Boys that was more adhered to, to white America. They love uh, rap music, they love the culture but the Beastie Boys were able to engulf that, those, those numbers, selling, what was popular, what was trending, why audiences felt more comfortable with the Beastie Boys um, than bumping a run DMC. They knew they loved the culture, they knew they learned the art, but white teenagers was eating that shit up. So, pardon my French, but that is the point that he was trying to make. Takes a little break and goes to the restroom and she's looking through the box of different music and she sees a tape that says Wu-Tang. Her curiosity gets her and she puts it into the cassette player and she really starts to listen to the gritty sound and the lyrics. And when he comes back into the room to ask her what she's doing, she hides the tape behind her back and proceeds to steal this tape. And we can already tell, hmm, she's getting this music that she appreciates, but that doesn't belong to her. And she's taking a tape that belongs to Tommy Boy Records, technically, even though they've been released or even though they they didn't make um, an album. There's probably a lot of connections producer-wise and contractually that she doesn't own. So she can't take that, but she takes it anyway. Then cut back to the moment when Bobby finds out that he's been dropped by the label. And we finally see what he does after hearing such news. And he goes into a little side area and he has a stick and he's beating on the wall with it. And all of his friends are coming out like, you know, what is he doing? What, Bobby, what are you doing? You banging on the wall? And he plays it off by saying, you know, I'm creating a new beat. 
yeah. And he starts to bang on the wall, but he's he was really banging on the wall at the fact that he was so frustrated with putting in so much work and he was still dropped from the label. And they start to jam to it like, oh yeah, that sounds really, really gutter and, and real street. So they don't know if he's upset or if he's joking around, but they buy into the fact that he's thinking of a new beat, but in actuality, he's really upset. So we were able to see his frustration after that. We then see that they go into the studio. Everybody's excited. They're talking about, man, this is going to be a hit record. We're going to be excited. And Bobby has this idea that they should go ahead and record and take advantage of of whatever studio time is being paid for by the by the label and just vent and put some stuff out and use that studio time because he hasn't shared with everybody about the news that he just had. So they start to develop going into the booth and they're excited, they're all, they got their lyrics in their hand and they can't wait to get in the booth. We then see Russell, he gets into the booth and he puts on his headphones and he's saying, la, 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 la. And they're like, hey man, we only got so much time. The studio is paying for this studio time and you wasting time. And he's like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I ain't playing around. You know, my voice is an instrument. You know, I, I, I need to warm up my vocal. They don't call me James Brown for nothing. You know, you know, just roll the beat. And they just looking at him like, whatever, man. Because in his mind, he's warming up his vocals because he about to rap, he about to sing, he about to do whatever he needs to do. Russell, Bobby, and Dennis, they go to the pink houses to see if they can get some heat. Because unfortunately, Dennis's mom has sold the gun that was in the house. She didn't want it in her, in her place. And she says, well, I'm sorry. I didn't want that gun in my house. So they go to the pink houses to cop some heat. As they're walking... They see so much violence. They even see someone in an argument and a guy pulls out a blade and slashes his face and they just walk by it like, you know, it's another day in the hood. You know, they hated being there. But, you know, Bobby is saying, you know, Attila is crazy and we need something that I can have so I can feel safe because he's after me. He has my music and he's still looking after me. So I need some heat. And as they're going through the peak houses, you know, you realize how desensitized they are from all of this violence and and being in the hood but as they're walking russell sees the gods you know the, the the brothers that stand outside and they preaching you know all of their beliefs and the enlightenment and and black man being the original god and russell says hey man let's go walk this way <laughs> you know and bobby is just like that's okay let's just hurry up and walk this way and get it over with and one of the guys st stops him and says prince prince rocking come here prince and Bobby walks over there and he says, what's today's mathematics? And Bobby, he thinks for a second. And he starts to spew what he's been reading in that book. And the guy is so impressed. The only thing he can say as a comeback is, peace, God. And lets him walk off. Then see the same young lady that talked with the, in, the intern at the beginning of the episode. And she goes to WNYU. I think that's the name of it. Yeah, she goes to WNYU radio station. We could tell from where she is that it's a college campus. You see people going to class. You see with the, the, them with their backpacks. You see a sign that says emissions, enrollment, all of that stuff. So we know that we're on a campus. She goes into this college radio station, and she says that you would never believe this that... I can't believe you played certain music on your show, but all of the nice music that you playing now that you're just letting me hear, that's the stuff that needs to be on your show. And he makes a reference again in saying, you think I like people from the record industry? You think I like these people from these labels? And she said, well, why don't you play this music that I hear now on your show? He says, when I get music, it's a dub of a dub of a dub. And if I play it on the radio, it's just going to sound crappy. It's not going to sound pure. So a dub, for those of you that don't know, is that you have the original tape and you have a blank tape and you dub it. So then you have that recorded. And if you want to do another dub, you have that new dub tape, a blank one, and then you dub it again. But when you do that, the audio after a while starts to get real distorted and it's not as clear. So that's what he was talking about. 
And he says, well, what is this you got me dubbing anyway? He was just like, oh, just something. Somebody needed a favor for me, so I just needed you to dub it for me. But when he takes out the tape that says Wu-Tang, half of the label is pulled off and tears off. So we don't even see the full name of who the artists are of this tape. And she won't reveal who it is because in actuality, she saw the name on the label, but she doesn't know them know them because keep in mind she's stolen this tape the guy inside the radio booth he's so curious to know what she's dubbed and he's kept a copy because he's smart he starts to play it and he starts to like what he hears guy and power they're sitting in a car talking and they're analyzing everything that happened with the the the, the raid with the cops and Shia's just like, man, I really can't believe Shorty was a cop, but do you really think she meant what she said, that she liked my music? And Power's just like, are you serious? Like, you really think that, you know, you're thinking about the girl and you're not thinking about the situation. We need to go back to the, to the spot and we need to get the stash. And Shia's just saying, you sure you want to go back there? Because the cops are clearly looking at us or either they're still researching our whereabouts. Don't you think that should cool off for a while before we go back and get the stash? And he's just like, nah, we need to go get it now. We've worked too hard. I need to get the stuff and I need to get some other things. So no, we need to go back to get it. We then see Sha. It appears that he's dropped power off somewhere because he's by him himself in the car. And as he pulls up to where his apartments are, he's very observant and he's looking around. And the first thing that he sees is the same van that was out at the house raid. So that was really suspicious. He looks over to the other side of the street and he sees some people look away, random construction workers. Then he sees someone sitting in a car across the street that's in a button up shirt and glasses and then he looks away. It looks very, very, very suspicious and they looked like narcs. He gets in his car, sits back down, and leaves. Gary, Dennis, and Bobby, they're at Dennis's apartment, and Bobby is telling Gary, hey man, I got this heat, you know, it's to protect us against Attila, and hey, you know, we even stopped by the guys today, you know, in the pink houses, but you would have been proud because, you know, I told him what time it was, and Gary's just sitting there like he's not impressed because he's looking at the gun on the table and he's listening to what he's saying and those two don't match. So Dennis goes into another room and Gary says, you know, you mentioned to me earlier that you were able to impress the gods and that your tongue is a sword. So which weapon are you going to use? Are you going to use your tongue or are you going to use this? You have the divine power to make a decision what you do. You're either going to use this or you're going to use your sword. Which one are you going to do? You have to make a choice. And he said, you know, I wanted to give this to you later, but I'm going to go ahead and give it to you now. Gary goes into his pocket and he puts down five G's on the table. And he says, I thought you would need that. Here you go. And they have that endearing look in each other's eyes. And Gary has a look like, you're my cousin. I'm going to make sure that you're taken care of. And, of course, Bobby is just like, wow, I can't believe that my cousin did that before for me. And he's very thankful for it. We then see that Slim Jim is at his steakhouse. And he's about to go and enjoy his steak. And he tells the waiter, I ordered this well done. And we see the same young lady that we see earlier in the episode that was speaking with the intern from Tommy Boy Records. And she says, I know you ordered it medium well, but it's better if you get it medium rare or medium well. And he says, and you are? And she says, well, I'm Tanya Mendez. And he's like, that's great. She says, look, I only need a minute of your time and I just need you to listen. I got this tape with some people that have that rugged, rough style their lyrics are great going back and forth. They even have a track that's a cipher where they don't even have a hook or anything. And I'm your next a and R, you know, in finding talent. He says, that's nice. And she's going on and on trying to sell her pitch. And he says, okay, okay, okay. Just leave the tape and you leave so I can just enjoy my dinner and enjoy my steak. Cherie is at a doctor's office. And when she looks out of the window, she sees anti-abortion protesters outside so then we know she's not just at the doctor's office she's at an abortion clinic and when the doctor walks in she says I know 
that you've made your decision, but I just want to let you know that you do have options. And I also want to let you know that you're not alone and we're here to help. And Cherie says, you know, could you just give me some advice? And the doctor says, well, we're not supposed to give advice, but what I would advise you to think about is, is this a happy time? Is this a sad time? And if you do have the child, what's most important is who's gonna help you raise this child and are they gonna be involved in your life? And she hands her some booklets and gives her some things to think about before moving forward. Back at Ohio with the family, and Randy walks in to tell his mom and dad the good news that he's made the football team. And she says, well, bring your sister down here so we can let her know too. He goes upstairs to look for Cherie and she's not there and he's telling her, well, she's not here, she's gone. I don't know where she is. And the next cut we see, we see her on a Greyhound bus heading back to New York. Seeing a montage shot that Divine has enrolled himself in an economic class or two. And we see that he's really interested about economics because ever since he worked at the World Trade Center, he listened about what people were discussing in little brief over the phone meetings. He was really intrigued to find out how are they making all of this money. We then see power. He goes back to his parents' clothing store only to go in one of the air vents to get a stack of money out. And the dad says, I've told you time and time again, I don't want anything to do. We don't want anything to do with what you're doing in your life and you bringing stuff in this store. And Power says, well, here you go. You know, you really need to get the vents fixed. And the father says, I don't want any parts of that. And he turns down the money. He doesn't even want money from him. He, he wants nothing to do with the lifestyle that Power lives. It's Tanya. She goes back to school and she notices that a few people are listening to the tape on campus. And she says, well, what are you doing with that? And how did you get that music? And they said, well, you know, we got it from the radio station. We know him and we're listening to it and we think it's nice. And she says, well, I don't know why you're praising him for it. I, I manage the group and they're very discreet and we're slowly letting the cat out the bag about who they really are. So what's your favorite verse? And they proceed to tell her what verse they like. Back at this flashback, back and forth throughout this episode, we see flashbacks of them in the studio recording this song after Bobby is let go from the label. Because remember, they're using that studio time. And we see Inspector Deck, he's in there, and now it's his turn, now he's writing. And we see that positive competitiveness between them all because after Inspector Deck does his verse, that even makes Shotgun tear up whatever he was working on. And he's like, man, I, now I gotta rewrite my verse. So that's the challenge and that's the competition that made that track so hot because you see them listening to each other and going after one another, trying to make stuff hot, being sincere. Like, man, that's a nice verse. I need to come with it. So then we see Shotgun get in the booth and he lays his stuff down. So they are making this beautiful track. Um, that is just raw and you could just feel the hunger and just the energy that just bleeds through what they're doing. Bobby goes back to Larry's, you know, Larry's where his mother Linda used to work. And Larry says, here you go, man. And you see a full plate of food. And he says, you know, it's on the house. And Bobby's sitting there and he's like, thank you. He looks at the food, but he's really not interested in the food. And then we see Attila walk in. So we can make an assumption that Larry is allowing this to be neutral ground and he wants them to talk or Bobby has asked Larry, can this be a neutral zone for me to talk to Attila or whomever this is? So Attila walks in and he sits down and Bobby says, I know what you probably heard and what I said wasn't accurate because I don't have any of that money. The record label, they have any and whatever profit that I made. And Attila's just looking at him like, that's not my problem. And Bobby then proceeds to try to spit some knowledge to him. And Attila says, I listened to, listened to that Muslim stuff that entire time while I was in prison. So I'm not trying to hear that. Where is my money? And Bobby pulls out the stack that Gary gave him and says, look, this is, this is five Gs. That's all, I, that's all I got, man. So where is my music? And Attila stands up with this gun and says, well, now you owe me 55K and walks out. Bobby and Dennis feel divine in on what's been going on. And divine says, I'll see what I can do. And Bobby says, 
I know that you're trying to help, but you just got out of jail. And we need to make sure that you're on the straight and narrow with everything. Just trust me. I'll take care of this. And Devon says, well, all right. Just keep me posted on everything. And he leaves. And Bobby tells Dennis, I know you got plans, man, to think about how we going you know, rob him or go in there and steal it, steal my music back. But to be real, the only way we gonna get rid of Attila is if we murk him. He got to go. And Dennis says, well, he leaves around 10 and he comes back home later on. And if we could just catch him in that window, I got you. Tanya goes to Steve Rifkin. And you could see that he is in a basic room. It looks like a suite that he's renting out. There's really nothing in there. It's just a nice little wooden desk and a few few file folders in the back. So it's just a, a office that really ain't popping yet. And she goes to him and says that I have this amazing music and I want to give this to you. And I really think we could do something with this. I kind of don't know who they are, but I manage them. She's just claiming an artist or a group that she hasn't even met yet, which is really selfish of her. And I'm just like, Ugh. even though I know the story, I have to view the show as if, you know, I'm learning the evolution of what really happened. But she's saying that I managed them. This is my group. And, you know, I'm going to find out everything that I need to know. And he says, well, out of all the labels and places that you could have went to, why are you coming to me? And she says, well, because you're starting a new label and you're hungry. And when you're hungry, you're going to do your best to make sure that the artist or the group does a good job because you're trying to get your money. And he says, well, I'll listen to it and, you know, we'll go from there. And as it's playing, she's like, yeah, I really got to find out who these, who these guys are. And as he's listening, he hears the fallopian tube verse that he heard Bobby spit a while ago. And he's in there after Tanya leaves, and he's like, I think I know who this is. So he, you know, gets that thinker's look on his face, and we can already tell that he's going to go around Miss Tanya and try to find these people himself. Bobby and Dennis, they're on the move looking for Attila. They got the heat. They both got some heat. And they're waiting on Attila to come out of the apartment complex so they can get him, so they can take care of him in their eyes. And as they're walking down the street, Cherie sees them from the bus walking down the street. So Bobby takes his place behind a trash can. Dennis takes his place a little ways away down the street behind a car or van. And they're waiting and they're looking at him coming out. And as he's walking out, Bobby is preparing like, okay, I'm really about to shoot this guy. And Dennis is looking out down the street like, all right, here we go. And right before Dennis makes a move to pop out and pop Attila, we have Sharita goes, well, hey. And he's shocked to see her that she's even there. And he misses the window in doing some something to Attila. So it's all on Bobby. And he has a clear view of him walking down the sidewalk. He's like, Dennis is telling her, you can't be here. Like, you got to go. And she's like, well, wow, what's going on? Aren't you happy to see me? And he's like, no, you really need to leave right now. Attila's getting closer and closer to Bobby. And at the same time, we see that Steve is calling Bobby. He's calling the phone in the basement. But, of course, Bobby isn't there. And then we have Sha that's at the house knocking on that same basement window to see where Bobby is. So we got Sha looking for Bobby, and we got Steve that's calling the phone trying to find Bobby. Bobby is waiting and waiting, and Attila is getting closer and closer to him, so close that he feels he has to make a move, and he pops him in the chest. And when he goes to, to aim the gun to make a kill shot to the head, he can't do it, and he just walks away, and he tries to leave, and everybody hears the gunshot. Dennis hears the gunshot because he can't believe that, oh, man, I hope it's not what I think it is. Last scene is a montage, so we have Sha who's talking more and more to his mother now. He had the feeling that he needed to be more connected with his mother. We see that Power approaches Shotgun, and lets him know that he got some work for him since he can't get his job back at the store where he was injured so he doesn't have work anymore. We also see 
Dennis, Bobby, and Cherie, and, and Cherie heading back to Ohio because Cherie tells him in the midst of it all that she's pregnant. So they're going back to tell the mom about her condition. And Bobby says, you know, you ain't told mom yet. Make sure you let me know when you do it so I can be out of that room because I don't want any parts of that. And Dennis says, well, you know, Bobby, I got something for you. And he hands him a bag. And it's all the music. And Bobby says, how did you get all of this? And he says, well, while all that was going in, I went into his spot and I got the bag. And Bobby says, dang, you were in and out of there like a ghost. That sound bite that we hear is, hey, Bobby, this is Steve Rifkin. I'm listening to some music and I really think that that's you, but I really need you to call me. It's really, really important. So call me back as soon as you can. And it's just gut, gut wrenching at the end because we are at that crescendo of this season. He gets the call of a lifetime, but he's headed back to Ohio. I'm sitting there like, ah, like I don't know the end of the story. <laughs> but it was just exciting to see, and that was the end of the episode. Let me tell you, this entire season has been amazing. I have been praising the writing and the organization of this series since the intro video. If you never saw the introduction video to this series, I ask that you please look at it because I give you an oversight of how to understand how this series was written and what to expect. So I just can't praise this show enough because I don't think people who view this realize how difficult it is to pinpoint so many key factors in several people's lives along the same timeline without it feeling rushed, without it feeling cheesy, and without it feeling lost and making the audience feel confused. What they do is, is they start you by learning all of the government names. They don't tell you who's who yet because that's a beautiful way of writing because it has connection with the audience to the character. You have emotional locking from the beginning. You start to care for each and every individual in the series. You even feel bad for Attila because you're like, man, why he so mean? He all right? <laughs> but it is a beautiful series. I can't wait for season two. It was fun to see a snippet of them in the studio and them learning to listen to each other and Bobby taking control and saying, okay, shotgun, you next. Okay, you, you next. And he even calls Dennis in the episode and says, hey man, do you hear this music? He leaves a message on the on the in, on the phone machine, on the voicemail machine, saying, We're in the studio and it doesn't feel right without you. But Dennis, he's writing stuff at home and he hears the beat, but it's still something holding him back. So I'm sure that they will get more into that with season two. What did you think of this series? I thought it was absolutely amazing because the writing was very, very good. The cine cinematography was great. I love the fact that they didn't make the cinematography come off as very gritty. Because if you make it gritty from beginning to end visually, that can be pretty draining. It'll make you feel drained. Um, if the colors are too gritty and so dark for 10 episodes, so they allow us to see who everybody is. I can see the signs. I know where they are. So that was just great. I love the fact that they didn't just pick any Joe Schmo cast. The cast was very precise in making sure that they had very seasoned actors in this series and for the actors that were new to acting we didn't feel that they were new so the casting director the direction the assistants the executive producers made sure that if you are a newbie actor and you haven't been any in anything that's a series that's stressed stretched out to this point we're not going to let the audience know that you're a new actor or you're a new actress i did see a lot of new faces 
Um, but with those new faces to acting, I'm aware of who they are either via Broadway or voiceover work. So those new actors are trying out their their chops in different e endeavors. So that was great. I love that Ashton took his time to look at body movement. I talk about all of that in the introduction video, how all of the actors took time to learn voices, to look at tapes and study and memorize body language. Great. I give this series a 9 out of 10. And the only reason it's a 9 out of 10 is the fact that, you know what? I, I, because I don't want to say 10 out of 10. Um, because the only, why wouldn't I rate it a 10 out of 10? <laughs> Am I being too harsh? Um, okay, the reason why I will put it as a 9 out of 10 because some episodes at certain points were just a little bit cheesy, okay? And if they took out some of those slices of cheese, it would have been 10 out of 10. I, um, but yeah, there were certain scenes and there were certain uh, graphics and things like that that didn't flow or anything like that but 9.5 it is on that cusp of great writing in cinematography let me know what you think follow me on instagram at the same profile name official bunt underscore e also check out my premiere introduction podcast show it's on uh the playlist as the bunny show it is a podcast show that i have and the first premiere episode is called you're so not okay and it's talking about mental illness um self-evaluation self-evaluation and evolving career life how social media plays a part in how you perceive failure accomplishment progression but not perfection i go all in into all of that make sure you check out that episode on the page let me know what you think whether you agree or disagree i would love to read your comments and also subscribe for subscribe tell your friends to visit there are also plenty of other shows that i review so check out those playlists so you don't have to dig through them all and also Watchmen that just started on HBO. Check that out. Check out my review on that as well. So until season two with the woo, woo woo, I will see y'all another time. Check out other shows on my channel. Wonderful season one. Bye. Yeah!